We start a brand new series today entitled Generous. And I subtitled this message, It's a Heart Thing. Everybody say, it's a heart thing. Now, who is the most generous person in the world? If you were to Google that, you're going to get names like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and from India, Azim Premji. All of these and more have given billions of do- billions, not millions, billions of dollars in their lifetime to various causes and foundations, mostly to foundations they created and control. <laughs> but are, are these the most generous people in the world or just the ones who gave the most money? And is there a difference? I would say yes. It's a difference in how much you give and, and being generous. There's a story in the Gospels where Jesus gave a very clear definition of the difference between giving an amount and giving generously. And we're going to look at that story in just a minute. One of my wife's favorite verses in the Bible is Proverbs 11:25. It says, "The generous soul will be made rich." Read it with me. "The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself." Now, when I look up the word generous in the dictionary, it says liberal in giving or sharing unselfish, large or abundant. Now, the the modern English word generosity was derived from a Latin word, listen to this, that means of noble birth. In the 16th century, the word reflected an aristocratic sense of being noble lineage or high birth. So in the 16th century, when someone called you generous, they were referring that you were of noble or or high birth in class. In the 17th century, it increasingly signified a variety of traits, uh, character traits such as nobility, gallantry, courage, strength, richness, and fairness. Now, when we say or think of the word generous, we most likely have a picture in our mind of someone who's doing more than they are required to do in an area of life. Now, remember, I'm tying this together. The King James Version of the Bible that we have today was translated in 1611. And so, in 1611, the word generous meant something much more than it means today. And we miss out on it when we don't understand that. You see, when God calls us generous, he's referring from the original there, that translation of that, as noble, of noble birth. So, 1 Peter 1 uh, First Peter, we have a statement that God ties in that generous to how he sees us. And some of you will know that statement. First Peter 2, 9 in the Amplified Version says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchase, special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When God calls you a chosen chosen race, a royal priesthood, he's saying you're generous. You're generous. That's what that word, the deep meaning of that word is not just somebody who's doing more than they should be required to do, but it's of like nobility that God is saying. And when we read that verse in Proverbs, the generous soul, oh, he's talking much more than somebody giving a little extra money. Let's take a look at the story in the gospels where Jesus defined the difference in giving an amount and giving generously. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, here's what it says. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple, and he watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus... But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Now, for us to get a better picture of what this looked like, in, let's take a little stroll back into history to see what Jesus was seeing and what it was like in that large room that day in the temple. 
See, the walls of the courtyard where the offering was taking place was lined with receptacles to receive the offerings of the people. There were 13 trumpet-like uh, uh, like vessels and, and chests that were labeled for specific purpose. So if you were coming to give to the poor, there was one labeled for that. If you were bringing your tithes, there was one labeled for that. If you were bringing a temple sacrifice, there was one label for that. Thirteen. How'd you like to have 13 different offerings in, in, in a service? You don't have to answer that. I, I, don't, I don't either. I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. So it, it, was, it was completely voluntary, but it was recognizing God's ownership and their stewardship. Now, Jesus was watching the people while they were putting money into these 13 different chests. The wealthy people were putting in large bags of money. And then along came this, as Jesus described to her, poor widow. Now, those are words of Jesus. That's, that's he, he defined her that way. He said, this is a poor widow. Her income was probably not sufficient enough to even take care of her own needs. Let's look at this story in a modern day practical view. Let's say that this, this poor widow came to you for counsel. Okay. And here's what she said to you. My husband died, didn't have any life insurance. We didn't have any extra money saved up, and all I have left are these two $1 bills. I haven't eaten anything today because I don't have any food. But as I've been praying, I felt like the Lord gave me direction to give these two $1 bills in the offering at Cape First. I really believe that God wants me to give this. What do you think? Now, here's you, here's you and I responding, okay? Here's how probably most of us would respond. First, we'd say, bless your heart. That's very generous of you, but God gave you common sense. He knows your heart, that you're willing to give this money, and he also wants you to take care of yourself. And he knows you need to eat, so keep the $2 and buy a little food for yourself. After all, you can't expect God to send food down from heaven when, when you have and give your only money in the offering. By the way, I think there's a, a time in the Bible where God did send food down from heaven for 40 years fed an entire nation millions of people. So maybe that's not accurate. Is that that kind of how we respond to her? Bless your heart. But you know, you, you need to take care of yourself. You, you, you need to do this. But you see, what she said was, I, 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 I feel like the Lord wants me to do this. Now, I don't, know, I don't know if she prayed about it or not. That's just my observation of just talking about the story. But what I know is she walked into the temple that day. Jesus identified her as a poor widow, and she put in two mites, which is basically, it's not $2. It's about a quarter of a penny today in our economy. That's about what it translates into, a quarter of a penny. Not a quarter, a one-fourth of a penny is what those two mites were. And she put them in the offering. Let's look at some principles out of this. Gen gen generous principle number one. It's not about the head. It's about the heart. Say it with me. It's not about the head. It's about the heart. See, Jesus not only saw the amount that she gave, but her heart in the giving. See, when Samuel was looking over Jesse's boys to anoint one for king, because God had, God had, 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 declined Saul and was going to remove him. And as he was looking over uh, those boys, God says this to him, because he's looking at the, the oldest, the, the strongest, the best looking, and he thought, surely this, this is the one. And this is what God said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man sees and looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Now, we're seeing this is what God is doing here. God, Jesus is looking at her heart. She's not just looking at a poor widow. He sees what she, she's poor widow. She doesn't have any finances or resources. God is seeing her heart. Don't ever forget this. God sees your heart. I want to say it again. Don't ever forget this. God sees your heart. He, he sees what's on the inside. Other people may not see it. They may never see it. They may criticize you. They may call you names. They may, they may do all kinds of things, but God sees your heart. If your heart is right before God, you're going to be okay. Turn to somebody and says, you're going to be okay. okay. He saw her heart, not her head. Don't ever forget that. Here's generosity principle number two. It's not about the amount. It's about the intent. Say it with me. It's not about the amount. It's about the intent. 
See, amounts are relative. It may sound impressive for a multi-billionaire to give away billion dollars, but when you have billions left over, it doesn't affect your lifestyle in any way. I mean, there's some of you, if you just think back in your life right now, we've got all age groups here today. If I were to say, we have a really great need here today, could you get special in the offering? Some of you could pull out a $100 bill and put it in the offering. It wouldn't be a big thing. It wouldn't affect your lifestyle at all. It's not going to change what you have for lunch today. It's not going to affect you anyway. Some of you could write a $1,000 check. There may be people that could write a $100,000 check here today, and it wouldn't affect your lifestyle in any form or fashion. But there may be people here today, if they put $10 extra in the offering, it means they're not going to have lunch today. You see, so the, the amount is relative. It's, it's, not, it's not about the amount. It's about the intent. And her two mites represented 100% of her resources. She was, was in essence saying, here's what she was saying with that offering. God, you can have all of me. You can have all of me, God. I'm not much, but I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to give it all to you, God. Now, notice Neither Jesus nor the law demanded her to give what she gave. It was the intent of her heart that moved her to complete sacrifice. Here's, here's generosity principle number three I see about that. It's not about the present, it's about the future. Say it with me. It's not about the present, it's about the future. So what do you mean, Pastor? Being generous is never about today, it's about tomorrow. See, being generous is planting a seed. It's sowing a seed into somebody's life or some situation or whatever. It's about tomorrow. This woman's generosity reveals another biblical truth. I learned this decades ago. When, and, and I grew up on a farm, so I, under, I understand seeds. I understand sowing and reaping. I understand all those agricultural uh, parables that Jesus taught about. I, I lived that growing up in, in, in a farm and, and even farming as a young man. And so here's what I learned. When, when what you have is not enough to meet your need, then what you have is your seed. You say, well, I don't have much. That's your, that's your seed. Okay, don't eat your seed. Turn around to somebody and say, don't eat your seed. Come on, come on, don't, don't eat your seed. Okay. You know, far farmers in, in the spring, they're, they're going to buy what they call seed corn or seed beans or rice, whatever they're planting. That, that's, that's specifically to plant. They're not going to take that seed corn uh, at home and open it up and, and scoop out some and take it inside and, and boil it and, and eat it. They're not going to do that, no. First of all, it's super, super, super expensive. They're not going to do that because that's their seed for the next year. And there have been times in my life, I know Rose and I have been in situations and through the years and pastoring and learning and doing in life, there have been times when what we had wasn't enough to meet our need. We recognized it was our seed. We sowed that and God provided for the need itself. Now, I'm just telling my story. I'm not, I can't tell your story. I'm just telling you my story. That's why I've learned this. When what you have is not, and what she had wasn't enough to meet her need, it was a quarter of a penny in today's economy. What she had wasn't enough to meet her needs. So it's not about the present, it's about the future. Don't eat your seed. Now I see three takeaways from this story. Let me give them to you real quick here. Three takeaways. Number one, Jesus watches what we give. He does. The word watch in this scripture means to look with a discerning eye. He's still watching. It's, it's interesting that he's watching. He, uh, and he's not being discreet about it. He's not like hiding over a corner and he's behind the blinds and he's kind of peeking out to see. He doesn't have cameras focused on the 13 different uh, receptacles and chests for money. He's sitting there watching. Everything that goes in, he's watching. It reminds me of a story of a burglar who broke in a house one night. And he's easing through the house and he hears this voice. Says, Jesus is watching you. Startled him. He waited a minute. And things calmed down. He didn't hear anything. He took a couple of more steps. He had a voice again. Jesus is watching you. Well, he, 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 he cased the place. He knew nobody was home. So he got his flashlight and he began to and he shine it around. And he finds this parrot sitting over in the corner. <laughs> he goes over to that parrot. And he said, did you say that? He said, yes. Jesus is watching you. He said, is your name Jesus? He said, no. 
He said, what's your name? My name's Moses. And the guy kind of chuckled and he said, what kind of stupid person would name a parrot Moses? The parrot said, the same kind of stupid person that named the pit bull Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus is watching you. Come on right now. <laughs> Why is Jesus watching? Accountability. Accountability. And also reciprocity. What do you mean? Because the Bible says when we give, it will be given back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's why. That's reciprocity. It's the law of reciprocity, laws of, of sowing and reaping. See, now that's contrary to the world's law. <clears throat> the world's economic law is get, keep, and, and, and do. Somebody says, how are you doing today? I'm doing all I can, can, and all I can get and sitting on the can. See, that, that's kind of the world's. That's kind of the world's theology of doing things. But God's is, if you give, it's going to be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. That's why Jesus is watching you. Here's the second principle and takeaway I see out of that is that Jesus knows the amount. <clears throat> he knew the rich gave out of their abundance money that they could do without. Wasn't necessary for their daily lives or businesses. And he wasn't criticizing them either. There was no criticism in this story at all. I've heard preachers preach this and, and they use it to try to beat people over the head that are giving generously to give more. No, 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 no. That's what Jesus is doing. He's just making a parallel comparison here. He's not criticizing them. He's just recognizing, I understand what's going on. He also knew that the poor widow gave all that she had out of her poverty. You see, the rich made a contribution. The widow made a sacrifice. Reminds me of another story. I probably shouldn't tell this one. Chicken and a pig were talking one day. Chicken says, you know, our, our owner really loves breakfast. I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll donate the ham, I'll donate the eggs. <laughs> See, the chicken's making a contribution. The pig, he's making a sacrifice. I, I shouldn't have told that story. I know I shouldn't have. See, it wasn't the size of her gift that stood out. It was her sacrifice. See? She just, they made contributions, which was fine. That's nothing wrong with that. But she made a sacrifice. Here's, here's, a third, here's a third little takeaway that I see, and we'll wrap this up. Jesus elevated the woman. He called his disciples together and told them what she did. He used her story to teach, motivate, and encourage others to be generous. He enshrined her story. He enshrined her story for all ages in the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, so that the future generations for thousands of years could learn from her story and her generosity. Her quarter of a penny bought her immortality in print. Little did she know that those two mites would become a model and a pattern for giving. What else can we learn from this story? Well, one of the things is that leave a legacy, not just an inheritance. We can leave a legacy, not just an inheritance. My parents, Rose's parents, left an inheritance. I'm hoping to, if, if I live that long, Jesus don't return and I, wherever I go, to leave an inheritance to my children. I think that's biblical. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but I, th I think leaving a legacy is much more important. So we can leave an inheritance for children. And my, 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 I've, I've had to help with I don't, more than I wanted to family situations where, where families were disintegrated by the inheritance that was left, by the greed in some of the ones. There's usually always one in the bunch that, that, that it just disintegrates the family over who got the clock, who, who got this. Sometimes it's not even a lot of money. It's just, I didn't get this. It's, it's, it's greed is a horrible, evil thing. And you know, the only thing that conquers greed is generosity. It is the only thing that will conquer it. And I'm, 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 just go ahead, just go ahead, get that dollar bill out here. 
It's the only thing that will conquer grief is generosity. It is. Leave a legacy, not just an inheritance. Be a giver, not just a taker. Be a giver. You, you know, there's a consumer mentality. Anybody getting anything this morning? Do I need to tell another story? Okay. There's a consumer mentality that has inched into the church through the years of where we just, it's like the mall. We go to the latest mall that's been built and nice and whatever, and we sit and we consume and consume and consume and consume, and then we move on to the next one and consume and consume and consume. When really a church family is not like that. We're in this thing together, and we got blood, sweat, and tears in it together. We're doing it together. We got ham and eggs together in this thing. Come on. We're, we're, we're doing this thing together. That, that, that's, that's, what, that's what being a part of the family of God is like. We weep with those who weep and rejoice with those to rejoice and sometimes we're weeping one year with one group and the next year we're rejoicing with that group because that's just part of the cycle of life but we become givers not just takers yeah you were supposed to receive i hope you're receiving this morning but but we become givers not just takers here's another little thing i see is make a difference not just a living make a difference not just a living you know if you were to win the lottery today First of all, I just pray that you would tithe and then give 10% above that. <laughs> Don't forget the love offering for the pastor either while you have it, okay? <laughs> Amen. Now, how would you do, what would you do with that? What would you do with that billion dollar? What would you do with that? What would you do? Would you make a difference or just a living? Let's see. Would you figure out how to make a difference? You know, most people that win the lottery go broke within five years, bankruptcy. You know why? Because they, they're, they, they're not generous. That's why. Because they, they don't know what to, they just consume. Well, see, God intends whether, whether you're working at a minimum wage job or you have a seven-figure a year salary or more. See, God is designed, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. God looks on the heart. We are all important in the kingdom. And her two mites made of greater impact on history and people through generations than all the other did. Nothing wrong with the other what they gave, but what he was showing was here is what generosity looks like. Make a difference, not just a living. Now let me wrap it up with saying this. Nothing reflects the character of God more than being generous. How do I know that? Because I've read my Bible. And John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he... Gay. He didn't say, for God so loved the world that he prayed for us. For God so loved the world that he made a few phone calls and encouraged a few people. But God so loved the world that he told other people about the hurts and the needs of people. No, for God so loved the world he gave. He was generous. And what did he give? The best. He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, being generous is not just about money. It's about life. In Galatians 5, through 23, we see what, what God calls the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, this is what ought to be growing in our lives. This is, this is what ought to be, be part of our lives that people see. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are we generous in those areas? Are we generous to be patient with the person? that the computer locked up when they're trying to check us out. Are, are, are we generous? Are, are we generous with long-suffering, with people who just keep stumbling, but they're stumbling forward? Are, 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 are we generous with our joy, or do we rob people of their joy? Yeah, I've seen people, they should be full of joy because they're taking everybody else's. <laughs> they're joy robbers. It sucked the joy out of the room. How do you know what? Stop pointing at people. I told you every Sunday, <laughs> stop pointing at people. Yeah. See, being generous may be an option for people who just want to live their lives without looking beyond their own needs, but it is not an option for the person, the child of God, who wants to not only obey God, but to make a real difference in life. So here's the deal. What is God saying to you in this message? Now chill out. I'm not going to receive another offering at the end because this is not about money. This is about a heart. This is about life. This is about how we live. Do we live as generous people? And you'll have to have a lot of money to be generous. This woman was the most broke, busted person in the room that day. And yet Jesus used her to show what generosity was really like. So just 
Stop disconnecting if you say, I don't have $100,000 in my bank account. No, 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 no. Being generous is a heart thing. It's a heart thing. What's God saying to you? Is he saying, great job, you're awesome, keep it up? Is he saying, thanks for giving out of your abundance, I appreciate it, it's making a difference in the kingdom? Or is he saying something like, it's time to live a life as a generous person. It's time to live up to your potential. And really, the big thing is, what will you say back to him today? Remember Proverbs eleven twenty five: 25, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. When we do our part, it's very simple. God does his part. When we do our part, God does his part. When we repent of our sins, God forgives us of our sins. The same God that does that when we are generous, God gives back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. You, you lack joy, give it. You lack love, love somebody. If you lack patience, be patient with somebody. You'll have opportunities. Because yeah. so when you give it, that person may not give it back. Don't look for them to do it. Look for him to do it. 